Today I'm out in Tennessee taking a look at the all new second generation Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid. This will give you 38 miles of all electric range, technically at seat seven, and starts under $40,000. That is significantly less expensive than the three row plug-in hybrid Kia Sorento. Let's talk about why you might want the Outlander, why you might want something else, and everything you need to know about Mitsubishi's new plug-in. When creating the second generation of the Outlander, the designers decided it should look exactly like the regular model. So there's no blue badging. In fact, no badging at all up front. We get the exact same look as you find in the gasoline only model. Big full LED headlights down there. These are reflector. We then have fog lights at the bottom and then Outlander spelled right across the top. The front end design gives me a little bit of maybe Land Rover meets Lexus vibe with the sort of hourglass shape going on right there in the black section. Going in for a closer look, you can see that the turn signals are integrated into this daytime running lamp strip. We then have multi-module reflector headlights. High beams are down there at the bottom. As we move from the front around to the side, you'll notice that the aerodynamic treatment going on here gives way to a fairly boxy profile. You can now get a two-tone color scheme on your Outlander, black up top, different colors down below, or if you get the 40th anniversary version, you could have a bronze roof if you so desire. There is some plug-in hybrid badging on the side that's really the only way to differentiate this from the regular model, aside from this charge door right back here on the rear quarter panel. At 185.3 inches long, this is solidly a tweener. It's four and a half inches larger than a RAV4, and that's how they're able to accommodate that third row in the back, but it is three and a half inches shorter than a Kia Sorento. So this is an emergency use third row. Although weird twist here, it seats seven, not six like you find in the plug-in hybrid Sorento. For the second generation of this plug-in hybrid, the engineers wanted to improve both off-road ability and on-road handling ability. So we have 8.3 inches of ground clearance, a healthy bump over the outgoing model, thanks to some creative battery packaging, and we have 20-inch wheels and 255 width tires on the top end trim. These are pretty wide, not just for the compact segment, but also for a mainstream midsize crossover as well. The rear end design is a little bit less adventurous than the front. We have combination tail lamps back here, so the turn signals and backup lights are still incandescent. The hatch is a little bit more raked than I had expected for a vehicle with a third row in the back. If they'd made that a bit squarer, maybe the third row would be a little bit roomier. At the bottom, we have sort of an homage to the exhaust tips, but the real ones are tucked up under the bumper. To understand the Outlander, you have to understand the drivetrain. You'll notice that on the outside and under the hood, it says plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. That is an interesting marketing twist, and for once, the marketing actually makes sense. Because to the driver, this really is going to be an all-wheel drive EV that just so happens to have a different kind of battery. The different kind of battery is the 2.4 liter engine over there on that side. Now obviously, since it's a plug-in hybrid, there's also a 20 kilowatt hour battery pack, mostly under the driver and front passenger seat, but also a little bit under the rear passenger footwells. That 20 kilowatt hour battery pack will power this for 38 miles in electric only mode. I don't have a full specification on how much power that battery can deliver. So peak horsepower and peak torque on battery power only is probably not 248 horsepower. I suspect it's gonna be somewhere on the order of maybe 150 horsepower. Details are hopefully coming. If I do have any details by the time you're watching this video, they will be on your screen. 248 horsepower and 332 pound-feet of torque happen when the engine is running, but there's no mechanical connection in that mode between the engine and the front wheels. The engine is generating power. It's connected to an electric generator unit here. It's then sending it over to the front electric motor and the rear electric motor, and then it's pulling extra power from that 20 kilowatt hour battery pack to give you peak 248 ponies. Now, interesting thing about the electric motors, they're not symmetrical. Up front, 114 horsepower, 188 pound-feet of torque. In the back, a little bit less torque, 144 pound-feet, but more horsepower, 134. So this does have a rear power bias in a decent number of its drive modes. Now, because this is a serial hybrid system, not a parallel hybrid system under most conditions, fuel economy does fall decently behind some of the competition. When you're operating in hybrid only mode, you'll get 26 miles per gallon combined. Now to help improve that on the highway, it can engage a parallel hybrid mode similar to what we see in some Honda hybrids. So between the engine and the wheels, there is a clutch pack that can close and it can then drive the wheels through a single fixed gear. That's basically going to occur in steady state open highway travel. So if you're just cruising down the highway at 65 or 70 miles an hour, it can close that clutch and improve fuel economy. But the rest of the time, 
especially at low speeds or at high speeds or anytime you're demanding peak horsepower and torque, it's gonna uncouple that, generate power with that engine and generator unit, pull extra from the battery and give you essentially an EV that is powered by a generator. Mitsubishi is not calling this a range extending EV because that is mainly a technical term that seems to apply for California emissions compliance. And this is close, but it's not exactly a range extender. But it is closer to that ideal than a decent number of plug-in hybrids. For instance, this vehicle has a standard heat pump so it can heat the cabin efficiently without turning on the gasoline engine. Again, the battery pack is located approximately in this area of the vehicle. Under the rear seats is where we find the gas tank. Charging the Outlander happens back here behind door number two, and it is a bit of a mixed bag. Some good, some bad, and some they did what? On this side, we find the only DC fast charge port on a plug-in hybrid vehicle in North America. But it's a Chatamo port, not a CCS charge port, which is more common and the standard really going forward in the United States. On this side, we find the regular J1772 charge connector, and there's an onboard 3.3 kilowatt charger. That is a little on the slow side. You can take the battery from zero to completely full in about six hours, so you could easily do that at work or at home and drive from the one to the other and be completely charged by the time you're done. It'll take about 10 to 11 hours on a 120 volt charge cord. That's what comes with the vehicle, and for most shoppers, that's going to be just fine. If for some reason you do want to DC fast charge your Outlander, remember that DC fast charging time is often a function of the number of cells in the battery pack, its operating voltage, etc. So charging is not going to be that much faster than a lot of EVs. It's going to be over half an hour to get from approximately 10% charge to 80% charge. I can't really see that many people DC fast charging their Outlander, but if you have a Chatamo plug in your work parking lot or at the grocery store you frequent, then you could gain a reasonable charge in a short amount of time. Jumping inside, you'll notice that the plug-in hybrid model is exactly the same as the regular Outlander. So we find some of the most comfortable seats available in this segment, four-way adjustable lumbar support in this top trim, also front seat massage. Now this massage functionality is more similar to what we find in some Buick models where it has three air bladders that are inflating and deflating, not rollers on the seat, but it still has a feature that you won't find anywhere else. As you'd expect in a top trim, we have two position seat memory for the driver, a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion, and a passenger seat with exactly the same range of motion as the driver's seat, including the massage and the four-way lumbar. Jumping into the back, there's plenty of room here with the front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall and the seats moved all the way back. This sliding second row seat mechanism is pretty handy even if you're not thinking about using that third row in the back because you can have the option of giving yourself more cargo room. I could push the seat a little bit further forward, still be pretty safe right here and comfortable with the driver at six feet tall and have a few extra cubic feet of storage space in the back. Versus the Kia Sorento plug-in hybrid, we have a seventh seat and it's right here in the middle. This is definitely gonna be more practical for families with kids in child seats, especially if you want that child seat to be in the middle where it's closer to mom and dad up front or just to be a little bit safer because this is the safest place to put a child seat in a new car. Scooting all the way over to this side, the front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I still have about an inch and a half of legroom left. But if you want any kind of legroom back there in the third row, let's talk about what you need to do. First up, I'm going to need to move this seat really almost all the way forward, which means the driver or the front passenger, they're gonna have to go forward as well. Then I go back to the cargo area, pull the third row into position and pull up the headrests. Apparently I hit the wrong button on the camera. So instead of recording myself talking about the back seat as I stuffed myself into it, uh, you just get this shot of me rummaging around in the door setting up the camera and then the camera turns off and I don't get to show you what the back seat was like because now I'm back in California editing the video. My bad. Fortunately, I did take a picture of me and Roman sitting in the back seat. Roman, of course, is from TFL Car. He is six foot two. I'm six foot. Neither one of us really fit back there in the third row seat. There's just not enough headroom. Headroom is significantly reduced versus the Kia Sorento three row that is available as a plug in hybrid. Of course, that's why I'm discussing it here. Obviously, you'll find a lot more room in the bigger hybrids that are available in the American market. But as far as three row plug-in hybrids, there aren't very many options. So you might just have to live with this teeny tiny third row. This is a new Mitsubishi Outlander and it's got a unique feature. What's that, Alex? It has a teeny tiny third row. Let's see how teeny. All right, let's see if two grown men can fit in the back of a Mitsubishi. Oh, dude. Grown men, <laughs> I'm still I'm still growing, Roman. <laughs> oh my, hold on. <laughs> need, need help there? No, I think I 
Oh gosh. This is this is this for is, this is the, people, right? This is the kind of third row that needs lube. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> this is a family show, please. Not that kind of lube, buddy. Ugh. You mean like like to there is a problem yeah. with the headroom, I would say, wouldn't you? There, There is a tiny bit of a problem, and we both have to go the same way, because if we tried to go... No, this no, is not no, enough no. room. You uh, how, about we go, how about if we go the other way? Hold on. <laughs> no, that doesn't work for that me. Doesn't, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> so, I it, could... Oh, wait, hang this on. Is, oh, hang on. Here wait. we go. Here we go. Yeah? I, uh, yeah, there we go. Well, now, I, uh, now I'm good. The rear seat back is definitely very small. There are no child anchors back here, no top tether anchors, no latch anchors, also no air vents, but we do have some square cup holders, one on each side. Getting in and out of the third row is pretty tricky because of the way that rear door is shaped. You'll notice that unlike mid-sized three row crossovers, it's not square, and that's because of where that rear wheel well is right there. So you have to hop through that opening, which is pretty constricted. This seat back is all the way forward. And then back here, we have this little plastic bump right in front of that seat module. It can end up hitting your thigh. It's kind of awkwardly placed. If you've watched this channel for any length of time, you know that I absolutely love emergency use third rows, this third row included, because it's simply more convenient than not having a third row at all. Yes, it basically is the purview of your mother-in-law or your naughty children, but it still has one and the competition doesn't. If you don't plan on ever using the third row, I suppose you could unbolt it from the vehicle and leave it in your garage. And I have to say, that is one feature I wish Mitsubishi would give us, which would be the ability to just remove this module from the vehicle and store it somewhere so you could get the extra storage space. Here's how it folds into the floor. It basically goes flat like that, like a bench. We then have a cargo well here where you can easily put your 22 inch roller bags. It's pretty deep. And then this flips into that well in the rear, giving us a flat load floor. With the floor in this position, I suppose you could put some very small knickknacks in this area under that portion of the floor, but you can't keep them there when the seat is moving around because of the way that it flips and folds forward. This is how the seat goes in reverse, and then you pull those headrests up like that. Another consideration to keep in mind, because of the way this floor folds, there's no spare tire. But on the passenger side of the cargo area, we do have a 1500 watt AC inverter outlet. Now that it's started to rain outside, it's time to roll through the interior. This particular model is the top end trim, so clearly there are going to be things in here you won't find in the base model. We have a dual pane moonroof. It does open. We also have integrated sunshades for the rear passengers. You can see how the second row seats collapse when you're trying to get into that third row back there. You cannot leave a child seat latch anchored into position in that way, however. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, two-way adjustable headrests, and I have to say, I love the attention to detail on this interior. Some of the interior is thematically similar to the Nissan Rogue, which I also have a soft spot for. The seats are very comfortable, and I also think this design is pretty attractive with the stitching on there. Lots of soft touch materials going on in the front doors, a particularly comfortable armrest right there, and an attractive dashboard. I actually think that this dashboard design is more to my liking than what we find in the new Honda CRV. Keep in mind, of course, there is no plug-in hybrid CRV. We have this strong line running right across the dashboard, but it's not all vent. The vents are just here. This is just a piano black trim section right there helping dress it up a little bit. This appears to be pretty easy to clean. Also lots of soft touch parts like this stitched section upper. This upper section of the dashboard, that's also a soft touch material, but you do find harder plastics lower, for instance around this large glove compartment. In the middle of the dash, we find the touchscreen infotainment system. This LCD is not quite as large as the one that we find in some of the Koreans, but it is a little bit bigger than the one in the RAV4 at the moment. Below that, we have those two large air vents, the engine start stop button, the controls for the tri-zone automatic climate control. You can see the rear control right there, USB-C and regular USB inputs. Then in the center console, we find the joystick style shifter, Unlock buttons right there, pulled down for D, pulled down again for the increased regen braking mode. We then have this drive mode dial with lots of different drive modes. Mitsubishi splits the drive modes into two different categories. These drive modes affect mainly the way the drivetrain performs, and then these modes affect the way the stability control and trash control in the vehicle operates as well. Normal is basically a smart mode where it's going to adapt to the way that you're driving. Eco-focused, power-focused, obviously that's going to be jumpy or throttle response. Tarmac is what they're calling basically a sport mode for on-road sportier driving. There's a gravel mode, a snow mode, and then a mud and deep snow mode. Over here we have auto brake hold, electric parking brake, two large cup holders, and then a softly padded center console with a decent amount of storage there. 
Moving back up to the dashboard, you can see that it has really started to rain pretty hard now. Up here we have a uh, heads-up display. This is a full-color heads-up display. And then below that we have a full-color LCD instrument cluster. This is standard on every version of the plug-in hybrid. It's optional on the regular model. You can basically choose whether you want those dials on the side or more of a traditional dial look. And then you can rotate through the various different options right there in the center. The software is very similar to what we find in the Nissan Rogue, but obviously adapted for Mitsubishi. And then of course the plug-in hybrid system with that little diagram there. The steering wheel is basically the same one that we find in the non-hybrid Outlander, including the paddles on the back of the steering wheel, but they serve a different purpose. On the LCD instrument cluster, that B icon indicates the regen mode that I'm in. Five is the most aggressive, zero gives you essentially zero throttle liftoff regen, although if you put your foot on the brake pedal, you will get blended braking. Moving back out to the steering wheel, we find volume up down, track forward backward, the controls for that multifunction LCD. On this side, some additional infotainment buttons, and then the controls for the adaptive cruise control and safety systems. Moving back to the center console for just one moment, let's talk about the two buttons I skipped over, the EV mode button. This is basically a drive mode because it cycles through normal, EV, save, and charge, pretty self-explanatory. And then this button here is the intelligent pedal or eye pedal functionality. That's kind of, sort of, almost one pedal braking. Now let's get the Outlander on the road. The first thing we should talk about is the feel of this hybrid system. This is gonna feel a lot more like an electric vehicle, admittedly, an EV with a noisy generator under the hood. And that's again because that's basically what's going on here. And in that respect, this drivetrain is very different from what we find at a Tucson, the Santa Fe, the Sportage, the Sorento, and the RAV4. Those are the closest competitors, at least as far as I can think of in the United States. The Kia and the Hyundai models use a stepped automatic. It's a six speed under the hood. It feels very normative. Even when operating in electric only mode, you're gonna feel those transmissions shifting. And the paddles on the steering wheel in those vehicles, they actually shift the transmission. These paddles, on the other hand, they're regen paddles like you'd find in a full EV. So I can click this down to B0 and essentially get no regen at all. The RAV4 lives somewhere between worlds. Sometimes it feels like a vehicle with a traditional CVT under the hood. Sometimes it feels like an EV. But Toyota's philosophy when developing that vehicle was a little bit different than Mitsubishi with this one. They wanted to use a lot of common parts with a regular Toyota hybrid system. And that makes a lot of sense because the Toyota hybrid's design involves a pretty powerful electric motor up front. So why change the formula? And that's why the electric motor in the rear isn't really that powerful. It doesn't need to be in order to give you 300 horsepower. But in electric only mode, it's not gonna feel quite like this. It appears that in electric only mode, this actually gives you a bit more oomph, but obviously when the gasoline engine kicks in, you get way more shove in that RAV4. And it's zero to 60 time is about five seconds. This on the other hand is probably gonna be closer to seven seconds. Mitsubishi said that in their testing, they expected it to be around eight seconds or so, probably about nine seconds in electric only mode. But some recent publications have been able to do some zero to 60 testing. They got faster numbers. Clearly you're gonna to have to wait for my official number till I can get this at home. I would also not be surprised if the stopping distance was a little bit shorter than average because this has 255 with tires, considerably wider than average in this segment. Going back to the nature of the vehicle, let's talk about this intelligent pedal button. As I said before, it's almost one pedal. I engaged it, my foot's not on the brake pedal. It's gonna slow us down to a creep. So maybe about two, three miles an hour. Let's see how fast it actually goes. And we're in six miles an hour and we're just creeping along at that same speed. If you wanna stop, you actually have to put your foot on the brake pedal. And of course we can engage the auto hold functionality and it will stay here till I floor it again. Now when it's floored, Regardless of the drive mode, the gasoline engine is gonna kick in to give you the best acceleration. There is a little bit of floatiness going on on the front axle because this doesn't have a mechanical all-wheel drive system, but also a feel, especially in the corners, of more of a rear power biased all-wheel drive setup, since that's exactly what's going on. That rear electric motor is bigger than the front, so it's always gonna give you a little bit of a push in the corners. It's not gonna make this a tail-happy Mustang by any stretch, but it is gonna be just a tiny bit more interesting than the average. If you want a very traditional feel, you're gonna want the mechanical all-wheel drive systems in this segment from Hyundai and from Kia. Those have a traditional clutch pack in the middle, traditional mechanical open differentials. They're gonna feel on snow, on mud, on ice, etc., exactly like a regular model. Whether or not that's a good thing for you is gonna depend on your personal preferences. I actually sorta of like the things that Mitsubishi can do with this dual motor setup. You can actually expand some of those rear driving profiles a bit more in software than you could with the mechanical system. 
But again, if you're worried about that traditional feel, you might want to go in that direction. And this certainly sends more power to the back than is possible in a RAV4 hybrid. What is always odd about Toyota's e-all-wheel drive setups is that since the power in hybrid mode is coming from the engine, and in order to get that power, you have to spin up the engine where it's also connected to the front wheels, is that if the front wheels are the ones that are stuck and you're trying to send power to the back, you have to accept a lot of front wheel spin to generate the power to go to the rear and then get you out of that situation. And in situations like deep snow or mud or sand where spinning your front tires is gonna get you more stuck, that kind of setup is not nearly gonna be as effective as something that can just send power to the rear. As far as my anticipated handling score, I don't really have a good way to judge this because it has been very, very wet out here in Tennessee. I suspect this is gonna be one of the better handling plug-in hybrids in this segment because of the suspension design, which is very good in the regular Outlander, and the fact that we have the wider tires, but for that, clearly, you're gonna to have to wait till I can get this at home. As far as ride quality, this appears to be a little bit better than the regular Outlander, I think, even though we have the 20-inch wheels. That's pretty logical because we have the extra curb weight in this model, and generally speaking, the heavier the vehicle, the better the ride quality tends to be. Where this is really gonna fall apart is fuel economy, if you're concerned about hybrid mode economy. If you're the kind of person that's always gonna have the battery fully charged, you're spending 99% in EV mode, and you're really just looking at the engine as a backup plan, then this is gonna be absolutely fine. And the electric drive mode ability, the fact that we have a standard heat pump, etc., that's probably going to be more important for you. The heat pump will improve your range in colder weather, and it means that if you don't wanna turn on the gasoline engine, you don't have to. Gentle on the throttle, don't go past that detent, stay in the EV mode, you'll be just fine. On the other hand, if you're the kind of person that maybe can only complete half of their daily driving in EV only mode, you might wanna take a look at an option with a shorter electric range because those are all going to be more efficient when they're operating as a hybrid. Over our early day of mixed driving, we averaged 26 and a half miles per gallon. That's right in line with the EPA 26 MPG average for this model. You'll get at least 10 miles per gallon better in the vast majority of the competition even better than that if you choose the RAV4 Prime. And it's worth noting with the RAV4 Prime that it's not only more efficient in hybrid mode, it's more efficient in EV mode using a battery that's about 10% smaller, yet giving you longer range than we find here. But again, they're always going to be compromises. And which vehicle is the best fit for you will really just depend on which compromises you can accept and which you can. At this point in time, I'm not quite sure which vehicle would be right for my situation, this or one of the Korean options, but there is an important thing to keep in mind with especially the Hyundai options. You won't find them for sale in every state in the United States. It's really just California and about 12 other ZEV states. That means if you live in every other place in the United States, this may be your best option or your only option since the RAV4 Prime is really hard to find. If you're looking to get your hands on the new Outlander plug-in hybrid, these are gonna be on showroom floors around the time that you're watching this video. And yes, there will actually be a plug-in hybrid on your showroom floor because every dealer in North America has agreed to take at least one plug-in hybrid and have it there so you can see it, you can drive it, you can experience it, etc. That's a little bit different than we see, for instance, over at Hyundai, where their plug-in hybrids are not available in all 50 states. So if you're in one of those states where access is limited to a lot of plug-in hybrids, you might wanna head over to the Mitsubishi dealer. You're also gonna to wanna to head over to the Mitsubishi dealer if you want all-wheel drive that's much more capable than average in this segment, especially when operating in EV-only mode, and a price tag that's certainly lower as well. This starts at $39,845, and fully loaded, like this one is here, ends up at $49,900. $995. At the moment in the U.S., the closest three competitors are probably the Tucson, the Sorento, and the RAV4. Of course, there's also the Kia Sportage, but let's talk about the Tucson. The Tucson starts at $37,050, so it has a lower starting price than this, but it doesn't seat seven. It only seats five. Now, seven, again, with an asterisk, those back seats are really darn small, but it does have them. It also has the ability to operate as an electric vehicle across a much wider range of driving conditions. So all wheel drive is definitely going on here. We get more power in EV mode, considerably more power in EV mode. It may cost a little bit more, but the electric range is also longer, 38 miles versus 33 miles in that Tucson. On the other hand, the Tucson will give you nine miles per gallon better fuel economy when you're operating as a hybrid. 
If you rarely operate as a hybrid, this is probably the direction I would go. But if you frequently find yourself operating in hybrid mode, you might want to check out some of the other options because pretty much everything else is going to be more efficient due to the design of this plug-in hybrid system. Next up, we have the Sorento, which is a three-row vehicle. It has a more accommodating third row than this. It's not quite as big as a Honda Pilot, but it's pretty spacious. It's going to cost you a lot more though. It starts at $49,890. So it starts where this leaves off. Of course, it's going to be roomier, but it's also going to be pricier. It's going to get you less range at 32 miles, but better fuel economy at 34 MPG combined. You do lose one seat, however, which is the weird twist with the Sorento. The RAV4 Prime, good luck finding one. It's practically unobtainium in the United States right now, but it's going to be notably more than this, 41,590. It is going to give you longer range from a smaller battery pack, though, 42 miles of all EV range and 38 miles per gallon after that, because the RAV4 is laser focused on efficiency. And as a result, you do give up some capability. Obviously, you're going to be giving up the emergency third row, but you're also going to be giving up the ability to send this much power to the rear axle. The RAV4 does feel a little peculiar in some mild off-roading situations because the rear electric motor is not terribly powerful. This one is almost twice as powerful as the one that we find in the RAV4, so it's going to have a very different feel out on the road. Also, again, this has the ability to operate like an EV across a broader range of operating conditions. So even though the RAV4 will stay in EV mode, if you press the right buttons on the center console, even if it's floored, this is going to be able to send more power to the ground when in EV mode than the RAV4 will in that mode. And I prefer the way that Mitsubishi has done the drive modes in here. Even if you're in the EV mode, if you floor it, it knows that you want more power, so it is going to turn on the gasoline engine. And for safety's sake, for me, that seems to make a lot of sense. Now, what would I get if my money were on the line? Well, let me know down there in the comment section because I have been debating this for quite some time. We've actually been talking about making our next long-term vehicle here at Auto Buyer's Guide, Alex and Auto's and EV Buyer's Guide, something along the lines of this Outlander plug-in hybrid or a Tucson, or a Sorento, or a Sportage. I think the RAV4 is out because they're really hard to find. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section, and should we get one of these for a six to nine month test window? I'm a little conflicted, I have to admit. I love the EV range in this, which is longer than the Tucson, and I love the concept of the teeny tiny third row, but the third row in the Sorento is a bit more practical, and it's a bit more efficient as well when operating as a hybrid. Let me know in the comment section, hit the subscribe button, check out our related videos, and of course, a complete review once I can get one of these at home to run it through the full battery of tests. I'll see all of you later.